Okay, we're back. We're live here at Community Matters at the three o'clock block on a given Monday uh, with Chris McKinney. Um, Chris McKinney is a journalist and an author and a, a, a person who appreciates the media for those reasons. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks for having me, Jeff. So let's uh, let's talk first about your books. I, I, that might be backward in some ways, but the books interest me more. Um, you've written several books. Let me just go through some of them anyway. Um, Midnight, Water City, um, and then there's a trilogy, the Water City tri Trilogy, and then you've written six other novels, The Tattoo, The Queen of Tears, M Bolo Head Row, Mililani Malka, I love that, um, Boino Good, Boino is one word, I think, yeah, and Yakudoshi, which reflects your age and mine. Um, yeah. Yakudoshi, Age of Calamity <laughs> is the title. So, um, I mean, this is really interesting. This is local stuff, but it sounds like it's more than that. Can you, can you talk about um, the common denominator of all these books? I guess they're all novels that you have written. Yeah. I think, I mean, well, the, the, the first novels from the tattoo to Yakudo, Yakudoshi, it's all pretty much contemporary fiction set in Hawaii. Um, it's usually, there's usually crime involved. It usually has a, a noir vibe going on. Uh, the last one, Midnight Water City, has both of those things, but it, is, it has been a bit of a departure for me because it's science fiction and it is set a hundred and something years in the future. Um, and it, you know, it, it's basically, um, it, it, it is technically set in Hawaii, but Hawaii is, um, only people who know Hawaii will, will recognize it as such. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, I mean, you could say that place is, is the co common denominator, whether it be contemporary or whether it be 120 years from now, um, I'm always sort of anchored to this place and it reflects in my writing. What kind of what kind of plots do you find uh, mo most appealing? Uh, are these um, books uh, of um, relationships? Uh, are they books of um, you know, institutional uh, transition? Are they are they books about violence and vengeance? What what are they? I think all of the above <laughs> is just sort of. I, I think that one of the interesting things about writing a book is that um, you can take everything that you feel any sort of level of passion for, whether it be positive or negative faction. And you can sort of just, you can just roll it out in a single novel. Um, I think that with this last one, uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I thought about before I started writing it is that today, I mean, reality is feeling more and more artificial. Um, and it, in some ways it's almost, it's more difficult to tell, write about our present reality. So it's sort of, that's part of the reason why I, I sort of turned to science fiction to speculative fiction, because I just, you know, I'm, am I going to write scenes in which people are texting each other and posting stuff on TikTok? And, and I mean, I just can't, you know, it just, it just doesn't, it just feels this, re, it just, our world now just feels, we, we're just so disconnected. Yeah. So um, where do you get the ideas? Um, you know, do you go outside and uh, look at the sky? Where, where, where does that yeah. come, come to you? <laughs> um, I can never I can never anticipate when they'll come to me or how. But for this last one, I was living um, I was living in Kaka'ako at the time and I was uh, sitting out on my balcony and looking at the Kaka'ako skyline. And I just want asked myself, I wonder what this would look like if you took the whole thing and turned it upside down and dropped it in the middle of the ocean. So that became sort of the, the genesis of, of this new setting that uh, I imagine where people live uh, floating on or live in buildings constructed under underwater. Yeah, let's take a minute and you, you, you selected a paragraph that would um, sort of um, give us a handle on, on the way that works, that world that you created. Yeah, uh, I would like to hear that in this context. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I'm flying at top speed above the ocean. Looking down at the pleats of breaking water, I'm amazed at how well organized something as chaotic as the sea can look like from afar. I break to the west side of the island and dip down to the well-lit coast. Sea scraper, cabana beach caps to the right, 
a giant aquatic theme park connected to the beach, shaped like a giant oyster with a pearl-like dome in the middle. Golf courses, a couple of shabby ones for the OBB, the rest exclusively for the money. This side of the island is where a few of the money live, the older ones who prefer land under their feet, who pro own prime acreage cut from lava rock, fronting vast man-made white sandy beaches. I'm gl gliding over the estate of Idris Ishana, inventor of the IE. He died a few years back at 121. His sh chateau is being converted to a museum, soon to be another stop on the Sa Savior's Eye pilgrimage. It's next to the shuttle field where people transport to the continents and other faraway water cities. The whole scene probably looks like any point in the history of civilization, the past smeared with the present. The past smeared with the present. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you favor the past or do you you favor the present? I, I don't I, I don't necessarily I don't I, I don't want to say I have a preference, but I think that you know even if you look at whatever exists now, I mean, like I, I can look out my window and I, I see houses that were built probably in the 1960s with houses that were just built probably three, four, five years ago, rebuilds basically. And the whole world is just this mishmash of, of contemporary technology uh, with things that are decades, if not more years old. And I think that yeah. that's always reality. That's that you can, you can look at whatever Constantinople looked like in the 1000, <laughs> it'd be sort of the same, the sort of consistent thing is it's always the past smeared with the present. <laughs> That's why I, I can really relate to that. So now you you uh, you told me before the show that this is set in the year twenty forty two was twenty twenty one forty two twenty one forty two sorry, um, mm -hmm. and and that means uh, science fiction and all, and it's in Hawaii, but you never actually mention Hawaii. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, if you listen to that prose carefully, you'll you'll yeah. see it is Hawaii. You know? Yeah, definitely. It reminds me of um, uh, the Descendants, um, that yeah. book, the book about um, you know the, mm, the, the 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 valley under the, um, the rule against perpetuities and uh, yeah, uh, what, what was his name? I forget uh, the guy who played it. It was it was a Hollywood, a Hollywood Clooney? yeah, yeah. Uh, Clooney. Yeah. It, it was a Hollywood version of of Hawaii, uh, and it was fictitious, but it was rooted in, you know, in a lot of fact about Hawaii. And um, I always felt that um, if somebody wanted to make a movie, it should be a local filmmaker um, mm -hmm. to really treat that properly. Uh, and that uh, Hawaii had a thousand stories like The Descendants that we could find and write and make movies of. And we, regrettably, we haven't done that. What about your books? Could they be movies? Um. Yeah, I, I suppose so. I um I sold the rights to a couple of them, so it's just but you know just it's, they've never been, um they've never reached the um the point of production, so you know I sold I sold the rights to two books. Um this this last this last one or this most recent one could definitely be made into the, a film, but it would be an extremely expensive film to make. So, sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we'll see what happens. So uh, what kind of reviews have you had, especially on the last one? Um, how, how much, uh, you know, how much support have you had on it? Um, you know, uh, Soho, Soho Press has been, has been great. Uh, I've gotten uh, reviews, very positive reviews, great reviews from Publishers Weekly. I also did an interview with them. Uh, I've gotten uh, reviews from Kirkus, from the Toronto Star, from um buzzfeed um all the bustle even you know the things that sort of surprised me uh, i got blurbs from writers like kiana davenport um who's a who's the the great you know uh, native native hawaiian uh writer of shark dialogues um so yeah I, it's it's newsweek i was in news you know the book was in newsweek magazine which was oh, which was oh. especially great because i you know i remember Newsweek being around in my in my dad and my stepmom's house all the time, you know, there were that and Time Magazine, right? So yeah, that was great too. So, so are you on are you on Amazon? If I if I type your name in on Amazon, yeah. am I gonna see yeah. all these books? Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. All all published by Soho. 
Um, so, so Soho uh, Mutual Publishing, which is a publishing company here, published the majority of them. Uh, Soho published this last one. Um, so Soho also published uh, about the, I guess what you call could call the mainland rights, the, the first two as well, so, uh, years ago, and they, they published those two, uh, the Tattoo and the Queen of Tears. But yeah, so Soho published this last one. So why, why did you write these books? I know that's a question you must have asked yourself a long time ago, because it's been a long time since you've been writing, but why did you get into this? Uh, it's not easy to write books. No, uh, it, it's, you know, part of it is, you know, part of it is luck, yeah, really. I mean, it is just sort of when I was in graduate school um, years ago, I, my master's thesis was my first novel, The Tattoo, and I was fortunate enough to have, get that published. And then it became something of, uh, I, it became almost a compulsion after that. It's sort of like, it's what I what I tell my my creative writing students um, who are interested in in writing novels or you know um, writing fiction is that you probably don't want to do it unless you can't help yourself, and I've I've come to sort of discover that uh, you know just for me it's just it's a compulsion. So I write because I can't help myself, and that's really maybe the only reason to do it because if you can help yourself. There, there are other probably more productive and, and financially intelligent things you can do with your time. So does it come to you? I mean, do you hear the voice in your head, the voice that tells you what language you should type out, the voice that, mm, that, 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 that is a sort of a stream of thoughts that keeps going? Uh, where is that? Do you have to work really hard at the language or does the language just come to you? I think that the language primarily comes from understanding uh, the main character. So it's sort of like once you once you can wrap your head around and, and imagine fully who this person is, then it's almost as if you're allowing them to simply tell the story in, in their voice. So that's that to me, that's a, a very important step is, is to really fully understand your main character. And then once you do that, then the telling of the story actually becomes, um, it, 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 that makes it kind of flow. So once I have that, I can, I can finish a draft of a book, you know, within a year typically. So, but that, that, is, that is unnecessary and that is sort of a hard initial step to develop. Well, oh, well do you develop the character in your mind before you write or do you develop the character while you're writing or both? I, I develop the character before I write the, the book. So, so, you know, that's what the sort of, the gaps between my books um, uh, in part are, is, are, is due to me developing um, character for the next book. So I don't really start writing the book until I, I have an understanding of the character. And I have a rough understanding of about how the first, Two thirds of the of the book is going to go how the how the plot will will move forward. Now that that can change over the uh, process of the actual writing of the book, but I, I need some kind of blueprint to sort of even just get the thing rolling. Are these characters based on people you know? Are the, is it autobiographical? Um, um, is it is it like Mr. Potato Man, where you have a little <laughs> a little yeah. from here, a little from there? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think with some of the early stuff, yes. And I think that that's, that's sort of what happens when, when you write novels is that it's kind of like music, right? It's a pop music. It's sort of uh, when an artist uh, debuts, a lot of their material is typically semi-autobiographical semi in the beginning. But what happens is, is that you spend that early. And um, eventually you come to discover that sometimes to, to your horror that you have to actually use your ma imagination and completely make stuff up. <laughs> so I think that I, I learned that years back. Um, I would say that as far as, you know, semi-autobiographical stuff is concerned, early on more, now, not really. Yeah. You said it took a, a year and that was quick to write, to write a novel. Um, mm -hmm. wh why does it take you that long? Why don't you just... Uh, Hear the voice, write it out, and be done with it in, in ten days. I, yeah, I wish. Um, and I, you know, if I could do that, then I, you know, I'd be on my hundredth novel. But um, but it, it's just, I mean, I do. You know, I there is there there needs to be quality control. 
So I find that, so for me, and it's sort of like you find your process, the process that works for you. And for me, the process is writing two to three hours every weekday. I, and there have been times in the past where I've exceeded that and I've went bananas and, and written seven, eight hours. And I noticed uh, fairly quickly that the quality suffers. So it's sort of the quality of the writing is, is good for at least, uh, you know, acceptable to me for, let's say, five pages, you know, three to five pages. And once, once I start cranking out 12 pages or 15 pages a day, then the, the quality of the writing suffers. So you got to know when to stand up. You got to know when to stop. Yeah, this is important because if you're on a roll, you want to keep going. If you've you know been <laughs> successful, you want to keep going. But but you but your as your experience tells you that at some point you got to draw the line, pencils down. <laughs> yeah, part of discipline is sort of knowing when to stop too, right? Ironically, yeah. is you know you, people think of discipline as always just the discipline of doing, but there is a discipline of stopping as well. Interesting. So, of course, this is, a, you know, directly related to your life as a journalist. Um, and can you tell us uh, what your career has been? You've named a lot of things you've done around letters and literacy. But what about the journalism part? Can you talk about that and how that relates to writing these books? I, I didn't. I mean, I, I wouldn't call myself uh, a journalist. journalist. I mean, I, I did a column. Um, for midweek for about a year, I think maybe a little over a year. And then I, you know, I did other stuff, little um, freelance stuff here and there. Like I, I interviewed Daniel De Kim for Hawaii Luxury Magazine, you know, stuff like that, like just freelance stuff. And honestly, that stuff was more that it really didn't connect with my fiction writing. It was almost as if it was just fun stuff. It was, hey, can you, hey, Chris, do you want to do this? And I said, sure, that sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. You know, review movies, uh, interview, you know, a celebrity. It, it was just, it's just stuff that sounded fun. So um, I did it. But it was, it was a total separate process from my fiction. Sure. And the interview thing is really important in journalism, isn't it? Yeah. You, you have to have the people skills to engage, to relate to draw out, you know, your interviewee and so forth, which, uh, yeah. which I think you do have. So, uh, but what about the writing style, the choice of words, the metaphors, the sentence structure, the punctuation, all that strunk and white kind of the rules of the language. Doesn't uh, one help you with the other? Um, I, you know, it's, it's sort of with, with, because of the, because of the, um, room to move that I was given by Midweek and Hawaii Luxury and uh, even with uh, the, the Hawaii Review of Books. Um, it's sort of like I, they just kind of let my use, let me use my voice and let it, let it rip. So it's just, so it's actually, it's just, it's far easier to write that stuff than it is um, to write, write fiction because I'm writing, you know, from the perspective of people who aren't me. But because because of the the sort of loose parameters that I, I was given um, when it comes to stuff like the Hawaii Review of Books, it, it's just yeah, just writing your voice, and so that that stuff was easy and fun to write. Um, the fiction is not always be, fun. Do you think books, especially fiction books, have become more important in you know the public experience, the uh, the public conversation than they were? I mean, you know, you always wonder if, if kids are going to you know, come up, um, not giving a damn about the written word. It's so easy to do <clears throat> television, radio, social media, and, and reading for hours at a time. It's just not, not as much fun. So query, I mean, am I wrong about that? Are kids reading? Uh, is the electronic download of books helping? Um, are, are, are we still a book reading society? Or is it on decline? I, you know, it's sort of, I, I feel like, and, you know, even I've said this in the past, it, you know, it has always been my fear that maybe, maybe books are declining. Uh, but then something, you know, I see something or I learn something that, that assures me that that's not the case. Um, for example, you, you, it's not the same. It's constantly changing and evolving. But to give you an example, uh, audiobooks. 
audiobooks are are the are kind of the rage now and that that's helpful that's helpful because even i i listen to audiobooks too because it's something that i can do while i'm driving while i'm walking around the grocery store and it it makes makes those times where i'm running errands or doing what i have to do feel productive and i think a lot of a lot of young people are listening to audiobooks um my daughter who's 17 reads kind of a lot um and she but she reads stuff that i would never read so she reads for example a lot of fan fiction and is fan fiction the sort of traditional literary genre of the no absolutely not um it's just it's just there's stuff out there they find stuff out there that they enjoy reading and it might not be the same stuff that we did or the same stuff that we had to read when we were in high school or college because i think the curriculum and the reading lists are changing drastically as well when it comes to that i wonder i don't know I don't know how much Milton is taught anymore in an English department. My guess <laughs> not, is not, not much. Not much. Yeah. <laughs> Chaucer, my guess is not nearly as much as before. <laughs> yeah. So let's, yeah, so let's connect all of this, though, the reading, the novels with, yeah. um, you know, the and, and, and sort of the public, the, those things that influence the public in various ages with uh, what we know to be very popular, the social media, cable news, um, and of course, um, those channels, I will not name them here, yeah. on cable news that don't tell you the truth, those channels. Yeah. Uh, so we have a you know huge divide about the truth. I remember when Kelly and Conway was um, part of uh, Trump's uh, campaign team back in 2016, she invented the phrase and sold it to us uh, called all, all, was it all truth or all reality. Um, mm. and, the, and the notion was it's okay to have fiction. It's okay not to care about the truth. Uh, it's okay to have alternate facts, which are in fact not facts. Um, and this, this has changed our world, hasn't it? And from the media point of view, only the last few years, we have seen an extraordinary transformation of the way news is delivered and the way news is consumed and way, the way false news. I mean, it's interesting that the, guy, that the guy who invented or at least popularized the term fake news is the one, is the most prolific fake news <laughs> merchant in the world. Yeah. So the, the first thing about fake news is call the other guy's news fake news, but then you give your fake news better. Um, it's a, com a competition for fake is what yeah. it is. I, so query, you know, how does this affect the public sentiment? How does it affect the public, mm, the reality as far as the public is concerned from the point of view of somebody who watches the media like you? I would say, you know, the first thing that I would I would note sort of in, in this sort of recent history is that it's kind of funny where we came from, because I remember, you know, when Obama was elected, um, social media was was celebrated right by the Obama administration as being this tool that one can use to sort of get the word out there. And then we saw we saw the other side of that, right, with the with the Trump administration where it, it, you know, it, it became something different. Um, I, I would say that politics, I think a part of politics has always been to get people to vote against their self-interest. And what social media has done has, it has made that easier to do. So, um, and this, this sort of acceptance where, you know, it's almost like, oh yeah, you, you can lie. So, it's yeah all it all what it really has done is, is it has made it easier for people to vote against their self interest. Um, sure, it's like the people, the people who um, don't want to take vaccines um, get COVID and they're lying on their deathbed uh, and they still believe that COVID is a hoax. Uh, extraordinary and, and, and talk about against your self interest. It's against your life. Is what yep. happens and millions of people feel that way. And so I, I, I don't understand, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a public, uh, a population that can engage in that because uh, it's not rational. But then, you know, you, I'm mentioning all this because I think there's a connection. There's a connection to accepting uh, uh, the facts, if you will, the universe of a novel. 
<clears throat> the world that you create in a novel mm -hmm. with the all, all facts world that politicians create. They're creating a fictitious world. Yeah. And, and you're just as happy to move into that world and accept the parameters and believe in it. And even if it hurts you, uh, do, well, do you see a comparison there? I, I do. And you know what makes it difficult to, I mean, fair, I mean, I, and I, I would say that this is sort of a, a uh, I'm trying to be fair here, is that this world that we live in is so complicated that essentially to truly understand it, you need to understand organic chemistry. You need to understand, you need to understand, um, um, you know, uh, climate change, you, you need you need like five different science degrees to actually understand computer science, um, like I said, with global warming and climate change. I mean, and it becomes easy to sell a fiction because not who, who knows all of that stuff? I, I don't. I mean, I, I, I understand the gist of what an mRNA vaccine is, but it's ex explained in you know, it's almost like, you know, people to explain this stuff, you people need to like use um, plumbing metaphor to <laughs> explain how this works or that, you know, and it's it sort of, then it becomes easy to, easy to lie. Uh, because I can, I can, you're, I can point to you and you can say, well, you should get vaccinated. And I can point to you, Jay, and say, you know, nothing about vaccinations, which is kind of true, right? It's just sort of like, and then, you know, and then it becomes, um, yeah, it just becomes easier for, but, and it's so ironic because this, this, this is a time in which we have more information available at our fingertips. I mean, hands down more than ever before. And we're just getting more stupid. So it's just sort of like, and I, I think that that's, that's part of what's going on. And I think that that's part of what I kind of touch on uh, in, in my book, right? Is it, just, just imagining this future where how, how is it that we, as a species collectively, we're getting so, we know so much more, way more than we ever have before. And it's just, it's not, make, it's not making us smarter. <laughs> it's just, it's so true, weird. True, true. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, 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 I'm learning from what you're saying, and I, what I take from that is, um, you know, I'm tired of everybody trying to tell me I should learn about this, that, and the other thing. I want to cut the corner on this. I want to get right to the solution. I want it easy. Spoon feed it to me real easy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. if you tell me that uh, horse warming medicine is the solution, you know, uh, yeah. or, um, you know, um, that toilet medicine, the bleach that Trump was yeah. talking about a year and a half ago. That's um, easy. That's really easy. And what it says is, Jay, you don't have to learn about science. You don't yeah. have to know about science. The, it's just as simple as, as, as you're right in front of your face. So take this and you'll find this works well. And in the process, you are mm, discrediting all the scientists who confuse you and make you work at it you know, and make you learn and read and study and whatnot. And, and I think there's, there's something about what you said is, it's a complicated world. And yeah. people are looking for simple answers. These are simple answers. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah and you know, when, when you look at uh, COVID-19, I mean, remember a novel virus. So it's kind of like this thing where they, you know, to expect the science community to slam dunk understand this thing within whatever, you know, within a week of when, when it's exploding is unreasonable to ex expect that. On the other hand, it's interesting because when it comes to politics, if you're, if you're leadership, you have to act like you know what you're doing, right? It's, it's reassuring the people that you, you have your hand on this, on this thing, this gigantic titanic size thing and you have your hand on the wheel of this thing and you have to act like you're, you can control it or you know what you're doing uh, at the same time when you're dealing with something that's so that's new that nobody really knows every i mean it takes time to to dismantle this thing and to, to know what it is and then you make one mistake and then or, or two in your messaging or anything like that then it, then it's over then people you know and then you know then you have uh you have, you have, you know, people, people. Staying. Crisis of confidence is what. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. But, and then I think that's part of it too, that 
<clears throat> that you know it, the world is so complicated that you need teams before yeah. that was a luxury now it's an absolute necessity you need a team to help you you need somebody who's an expert in this 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 and this and your job as a leader is to put it together and make sense of it and manage manage the thinking process among yeah. other things and um any link in the team that's weak uh, and the whole team fails potentially um, yeah like, and like in a, go ahead yeah, there's no, I mean, in 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 a, in, a, in people people probably mistakenly believe that in the scientific community is always on the same page and it's always there's always a consensus. That's just it's 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 it can, it's as divisive as politics sometimes, right? So it's just sort of, I mean, when Einstein came out with relativity, uh, other physicists thought he was he was a crazy idiot, right? So it's just sort of, um, so you know, there, there there isn't, and but people expect that, right? It's like everybody's supposed to, you know, scientists, science, you know, they all have they are supposed to agree, and they're all they're supposed to know exactly what a thing is, and you know discovery is an evolving process learning is an evolving process so yeah it's i think healthy skepticism is is good but once once you get into the realm to me where your beliefs like you have beliefs and it checks the box of one political party all of the boxes of one political party or the other i think you've become indoctrinated how is it that you agree with every single thing one person says unless you've been indoctrinated isn't you know, that, that that's, that's a really a good question I mean, yeah it's so. a really good point i totally agree with that it's 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 too good to believe yeah <laughs> so yeah. You and then your it. brain releases chemicals that that uh make you experience pleasure when people tell you things that you agree with so you know it's just so when you whether it be msnbc or, or fox news you're watching it and if you if you believe if you agree with all of that you're essentially getting pleasure out of hearing somebody um agree with you on everything and so you keep watching and watching it's like a, a rat you know hitting the thing for another snack a, pe a little pellet or whatever it's kind of the same principle does it bother you if i tell you i agree with you on everything chris <laughs> i hope not jay <laughs> No, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to start a cult. <laughs> <laughs> well, take, take the cult phenomenon, take social media, take alternate facts, take, um, you know, what's been happening over the past few years, just sort of the revelation about the society in this country and how they uh, deal together and, and how they find divisiveness. Uh, whether uh, among themselves as an internal process or an external process, including a process from Vladimir Putin, you know, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. Take all these things to you. Take, take the decline of the print press. Mm -hmm. Take the decline of the distance between, uh, you know, reported news and opinion. Mm -hmm. um, take the, the merger of reality between um, the, the facts you hope you hear and on television or in the paper versus the facts you hear in novels such as the ones you write and, and live you know create those worlds mm -hmm. okay here's my question it's coming uh, <laughs> where's this going is there hope for us uh, how does this turn around i um i i think i i think that the what it is i i think i mean i hope so I mean, I, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. I would say that, like like anything else, I mean, maybe we as a species, every once in a while, we need to get smacked around a bit, right? So it's just sort of, <laughs> so it's gonna, it becomes this thing where you know, and you, nobody wants anything bad to happen, but you know, and we, sometimes we're our worst enemies, you know. Maybe maybe something will happen that short, sort of shakes at least the majority of us. Not everybody is going to be on the same page probably ever. So it's just sort of, you know, just enough because, and one of the things too, one of the scary things is what we're really talking about in essence is we're talking about power. And it's just what we're seeing is what happens and it's happened throughout our history is when one person or a group of individuals or just a, a group has too much wields too much power over uh, other people i mean it will it, it will almost always be abused and today that happens to be um stuff like social media i mean it, who owns 
who owns Facebook, Instagram, and a large chunk of Koi, right? One guy. <laughs> it's just, and who who owns Amazon, right? And and you know, and we it's funny too, because you know, I'm not gonna characterize somebody like Jeff Bezos as some kind of malevolent evil person, because on the, you know, he also owns the the Washington Post, which we talked discussed earlier is, is probably the most credible newspaper. Uh, around right now so it's not as if you know but that is a lot of power a lot of I mean in in retail Amazon that's that's too it's and it's hard not to abuse that um and that's that's what I think what we're seeing is just uh, these these vacuum this these these entities getting probably too much power and something probably needs to be done about that on the government level um, in order to sort of stave it or, you know, lessen the, the, the negative aspects of it. Um, other than that, they're just going to get more powerful. Well, we're certainly in a, in a, in a trans, transition. I like to say a transformation right now. And I think that's uh, in, in a, in a left-handed way, that's, that's stimulating to be in it and to realize you're in it and then to watch the sea changes around you and to say, holy moly, this is different. Different yeah. than I than I in my life so far, and certainly different than what I expected. So my question to you, Chris, is mm -hmm. in your novels going forward, are you going to reflect these um, you know, transformations that are happening around us? Is, is this part of the new world you're building? Um, and are your characters going to look like me? <laughs> <laughs> it. Uh... It, it, it is. I, I don't think, you know, one of the things about writing, writing fiction, at least for me, and I think it's, it's true for a lot of other novelists, is that you can't dampen out the sound of what's going on while you're writing a book, right? So when, you know, I, when I wrote the book that just came out, I mean, I'd written it um, uh, before Trump was elected. And so in a, in a way, um, you know, I, I can't say that this trilogy, you know, because the, the, it'll take a couple of years for the second book and the third book. It's there's no way I could say that it hasn't been touched by Trump, by COVID, by this sort of this this crazy reality in which we all carry around this electronic device that if we somehow misplace or it's it's out of our reach for even just an hour, we start going crazy. Right, so it's just sort of, um, yeah. So all of that stuff is definitely sort of addressed in in what I'm writing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you start it yet? Did you start that book yet? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So this is the, the Midnight Water City. This this book is uh, the first book, and then um, it'll. This is the hardcover, and it's out in, uh, of course, in Kindle and uh, in audio, in Audible, uh, audio book as well. Uh, so this this one will be released uh, next summer in paperback. Then the uh, hardcover of book two will be released, and it's sort of like so the whole book series thing. It's usually I think there's a, maybe a year or two gap between each book, and then this one just came out. But I, I wrote the other ones already, so they're they're ready. I mean they're ready to go through editing, which is what I would call sort of a, a literary audit. It's a painful but necessary experience. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So, but all I talk all about all of all. It's it's sort of yeah. It, there's there's some allegorical elements and a lot of this this stuff. What um, we're going through now. I mean, it's impossible. Almost, I feel feel like it's almost not. It's almost impossible not to talk about as I'm writing fiction. Yeah, and you you have no intention of giving it up. This is a lifelong thing, right? Yeah, I, you know, can't help myself. So it's just, it's, I might as well sort of embrace that reality. And yeah, I'll, I'll as, as long as I have ideas, I'll, I'll continue to do it. As long as people sort of offer me opportunities to freelance this or that, and it interests me, I'll, I'll definitely, I definitely do it. I, I love writing. So yeah. Will you keep on teaching? Yeah. I mean, I, I teaching has, has been great, great to me. I mean, because it's sort of like, um, you know, I, I've taught, for almost 20 years now. I mean, I've taught primarily online, um, you know, freshman composition and creative writing. And so what it what it has allowed me is this sort of flexibility as far as when I do things. So it's it's been great um, to have that 
and to be able to write and even have kids, you know, so I have two daughters, right? And, you know, the, 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 a job with those, those, that kind of flexibility has been great for my writing career and for me as a parent. Yeah, so, great and I, love, I like the kids. So yeah, so it's, it's win, win, win. Well, it's um, Chris McKinney, a man of many seasons, <clears throat> a Renaissance man in many ways, touched so <laughs> many parts of the public conversation, really appreciate that. And I hope a lot of people write into you and, and tell you their story ideas and you can include yeah. at least parts of them in your characters going forward. And we yeah. should we should look forward to see more of your more of your prolific writing going forward uh, as a as a kind of barometer, as a kind of canary in the coal mine, uh, yeah. as a as a kind of bellwether for where where we're all going. That's what I think you help us with. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jay. That, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. Chris McKinney, author um, and media man. Aloha. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Jay.